to be here with you this evening and to share together with you and to be part of this end of the week celebration. I would like to put it like that. We have had a busy week and uh, I was also up rather earlier than I am normally this morning. I want to thank Bernard for the invitation to be part of that businessman's group, Christian businessman's group this morning, to be able to share together with them. And that was a great experience. And to talk with many of you about different things, those who've been able to visit with me, I've really appreciated that. And it seems surprising that we are coming towards the end. We finish tomorrow evening. And yet we still have many interesting things to talk about, so let's not anticipate the end before it comes. Number 10 in our series, salvation is healing. More than, quotes not guilty. As we've seen so often, as we've talked this week, we've been very concerned generally in the way that we've dealt with God to get the not guilty verdict. We want to have God say, it's okay, you're forgiven, you are pardoned, you are not guilty anymore. And we may not always feel forgiven. Uh, I think it was Alfred Kobitzi who said, God may forgive you, but your nervous system won't. Uh, you have to internalize it. You have to accept that forgiveness and that forgiveness has to change you. And that's really where I want to take us tonight because while we are so preoccupied with our legal status before God, wanting to be not guilty because we worry about the consequences if we are guilty, what do we really want? As I've said before, when you go to the doctor and say, I would like to have healing, if the doctor says, it's all right, I forgive you, that really is not primarily what we're looking for. We're looking for a change, a healing. And as you look into the fundamental concept of salvation, you discover that that's exactly what it's all about. Those of you who've understood a little bit about language and looked at some of these words will recognize that salvation has in it S-A-L-V. And if you put an E on the end, what do you have? Salve. And what do you use salve for? Particularly you know, those people who are doing work on the eyes maybe will recognize eye salve. You put something on your eye to do what? To heal it. To cure it. And so... In the very word in English that we use, salvation, we understand that it's primarily concerned about healing. And I want to show you a very interesting series of words. Are you ready for a little bit of in-depth study tonight? You've had a good week, you're relaxed, it's Friday evening, and your minds are engaged and you're ready to think. Yes? Good. Anybody who's ready to sleep, well, maybe they, your neighbor could help you stay awake as we go through some of these really fascinating things here. I want to take you to Luke chapter 8. And this is what you might call an incidental miracle. It wasn't something that was particularly planned. It just happened on the way. In fact, Jesus is on the way to even a greater miracle. Jairus' daughter is waiting. She is dying. And of course, you realize by the end of this story that Jairus' daughter is dead and there's a, yet there's a wonderful solution, a wonderful answer from Jesus to that. But as he walks along on his way, to Jairus' house. The crowds are jostling and pushing around him. His disciples are trying to make a way through the crowd, perhaps, and the people are bumping into him all the time. And a woman 
who has had a problem with bleeding for 12 years comes along. It's recorded that she had had this problem for 12 years and she could find no healing. You have the word healing. Or maybe it will say cure in your version. Now, who is writing this down for us now? What gospel are we in? Luke. What was Luke's profession? He was a physician. He was a doctor, was he not? So let's pay very careful attention to the words that he uses as he speaks about this situation. The word he uses for healing in this initial case is therapeuo, which isn't too hard for us to understand in English, is it? That's where we get the word therapeutic from. It was something that brings some kind of relief. But it's not absolute. It's just a therapeutic kind of cure. Something that helps, alleviates the problem. And so that's what she's been looking for all along. For some kind of therapeutic cure. For some kind of therapy. We get the word therapy from the same word. That's what Luke says. This is what the woman was trying to get by going to see all the various doctors, never got any cure for what she had. Coming up behind Jesus, Luke 8, 44, she touched the fringe of his robe. Why that? Why does she come up and try to do this secret miracle, do you think? Well, she didn't really want to confront Jesus. Plus, there was another little problem because of the beliefs of the time. If you had that kind of illness, you were what? Technically, you were unclean. So, she didn't really want to make a big thing out of this, she just, but she did want to get a cure for her problem. And we can perhaps all understand it. She thought to herself, well, if I could just touch the hem, just the edge of his garment, then I'm sure I will be healed. She does that. Immediately, straight away, the bleeding stops. She knows she's cured. And what does Jesus say? Amongst all that crowd, with everybody pushing and shoving and jostling, he says, who touched me? Kind of an f- odd question. At least it must have seemed to the disciples, don't you think? Why are you asking? <laughs> What do they say? Everybody denied it. And Peter says, always Peter speaking up for the rest, isn't it? Master, this whole crowd is pressing up against you. Why are you asking who touched me? And why would you want to ask anyway? What what deal do you want to make of it? You perhaps could say. But Jesus said, someone deliberately touched me for I felt healing power. Go out from me. He knew that somebody had wanted healing. And he had healed that person. The woman sees that she can't remain hidden any longer. When the woman realized that she could not stay hidden, she began to tremble and fell to her knees in front of him. It's all out. She has to explain what she had thought, the reasons why, what she had done, and that she had sensed that she had been completely cured of her ailment, of her sickness. The whole crowd heard her explain why she had touched him and that she had been immediately healed. And now Dr. Luke uses another word for healing. He uses the Greek word iomai, which we don't have an equivalent in English. This is healing in the sense of getting a total cure. If you went to the doctor with some sickness and you took your medication or whatever, you were completely cured of that. You didn't have that problem anymore. That's what it means. So not only... Did it go from 
therapy, from therapuo, it now is Iomai. She was looking for a little bit of therapeutic help. Now she gets a total physical cure. Praise the Lord. What a wonderful thing. She's totally cured. But it hasn't stopped yet. Because when Jesus speaks to her, he says to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. And by now, you'll be expecting that Dr. Luke is using a different word. And you're right. He uses a completely different word to therapy or an IOMI. He uses the word sozo, S-O-Z-O, sozo. And this means that she has been completely and totally and thoroughly healed. And yet there's also more. If you go back to the previous chapter of the woman who anoints Jesus, there's that whole long story there about how she anointed Jesus with this beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. She kneels at his feet, weeping. She washes his feet with her tears, and puts on the perfume. And Simon there, in whose house this was happening, complains, and Jesus has to talk very severely with him, really. And in conclusion, in verse 47, he says, I tell you her sins, and they are many, we believe this is Mary, Mary Magdalene, have been forgiven, so show, she shows me much love, but the person who's forgiven little only shows a little love. So who has been forgiven the most here, Simon? That's why I can say your sins are forgiven. And this is what the Pharisees of which party that Simon belonged. That's part of the group he was. He was one of them. Your sins are forgiven. And the men at the table argue, who is this man that he goes around forgiving sins? Because who can forgive sins? Only God. But then he says to the woman in verse 50 of chapter 7, a very interesting statement. He says to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. What did he say to the woman with the issue of blood? Do you remember? Your faith has healed you. Go in peace. It sounds very similar, doesn't it? What if I tell you that in the Greek, the statement is exactly the same? The words are exactly the same. There is no difference between the Greek there of 750 and 848. They are identical. The very exact same words in the original. In one case, it's translated, your faith has saved you. The other, your faith has healed you. What do you think that word means now? It can be translated either way, depending on the context. So maybe we should put those words together and say it the same way to both those ladies. Your faith has salvation healed you. Go in peace. Because we learn from this and so much more in Scripture that salvation is healing. You are healed from the disease of sin, from the sickness of sin, from the ravages of sin in your life. In fact, in Exodus 15, 26, God identifies himself as the God, the Lord, who heals us. He says, I am the Lord who heals you. So this God who comes in to work with us 
is healing us from not only the physical healing, but the healing of the physical illnesses, but also the spiritual illnesses that we have. We see Jesus as he went from place to place, spending a lot more time in healing than in anything else. Why? Because that's the kind of person God truly is. He is a God who heals. He is the one who wants to come in and remake us into his image once more. You know, so I have tried to take that and put that into my mind nowadays and say, Lord, could you fix those bad that bad wiring that I have in my head, those neurons and synapses that are firing but in the wrong direction, could you come in and help with that? And I don't think God comes in and, and directly meddles with our brain chemistry perhaps. But that's what I would like. I would like to be healed so that I don't think even the wrong way. Of course, we still always have freedom of choice. We still have the right to choose whether we go that way or that way. And so many of our problems of sickness are because of our own personal choices. Although we also pay the price for the sins of our parents, our forefathers too, don't we? I was in Loma Linda having a health checkup and uh, they went through all the kinds of different things and they said, well, I'm sorry we have to tell you, but you chose your parents badly. I said, well, I'll go back and fix that, shall I? <laughs> there are some things that are just there in terms of the genetics or of hereditary that we can't go back and change. Uh, but there are many things that we can do to live healthy lives. I'm so delighted that this faith community has placed so much stress on health, physical health. I remember one person's talking about the physical health aspects of the message and said, you know, but it's so hard to bring that over to talk about forgiveness. And he said, no, it's not. It's the same thing. Jesus was healing people. He was healing them from their physical ailments, from their sicknesses, and he was also healing them from the sin sickness, if you like. Healing us from the damage of our own foolish choices that have led us to do so many wrong things lead us in so many bad directions. I was in a camp meeting one time. As an illustration, the pastor was there at the front, and he wanted to show how Jesus saves us. So he had taken an apple, put it in a rubbish bag that had all the messy, what can I say? refuse from the kitchen. It had the leftover porridge. It had all the potato peelings. It had everything that had been thrown. And he put the apple down there and rubbed it around. And he said, who wants this lovely apple? Everybody went, oh, yuck. No, that looks terrible. I don't want an apple like that. That is disgusting. No way. We don't want that. Then he took a nice clean bowl of water and very carefully washed the apple, removing all the, the rubbish from it, all the stuff that had stuck to it, and cleaned it up and then wiped it with a nice cloth so it was dry and shiny. Now who wants the apple? Everybody wants the apple. And he said, see, that's what Jesus does for us. He takes us we're all apples covered with the filth of sin and he washes us clean and dries us up and polishes us so we're sparkling and bright and perfect like this perfect apple. I think he was doing the best he could in trying to illustrate salvation. But afterwards I said to him, you know, you need to do something a little more than that because at heart that apple was still okay, wasn't it? It was just covered up with a mess of sin. 
What you should have done, I said, was to take an apple that was rotten to the core, completely rotten, brown through and through, and have that transformed to a perfect apple. Because that's what Jesus does. He says, that's a bit more difficult. And I'm not a magician. I said, I know what you mean. But that is, to me, the big difference in what we are trying to say here. We are not just covered with a, an outside accumulation of sin. Sometimes we talk about being washed clean. We use lots of imagery. I'm not arguing with that. But I'm simply saying it's from, it has to be from the inside out. Because our hearts are rotten from within, aren't they? That's the problem that we face. Not that we've kind of, we're generally okay, but we need a little bit of a cleaning up and a sprucing up. And once we've had a good shower and combed our hair, then we're fine. No. It's the thoughts of our hearts, rather like those people back there in the time of, of the flood, whose thoughts were always evil. We, are, we must identify with that. And that's the kind of people that we are. And that's what God needs to come in and do to heal us. It has to be, well, if we're going to talk about washing, it has to be detergent that works from the inside out. We have to be clean, transformed, renewed from the inside out. So, because it's not just on the outside. That's what he said was the problem with the Pharisees. They said, well, we're doing all we can to stay clean. We even wash ourselves ceremonially. We are trying to illustrate that we are not bad people. And Jesus said, well, it's not the, the gnats that you're straining out of the milk and everything that, that make you unclean. It's from what your insides are like that comes out that makes you unclean. And he, he went into some detail speaking about that, how we really express this evil from our hearts. And when we say hearts, of course, we, re, we really mean our minds. Our minds are thinking these evil thoughts. That's where it comes from. And so it's not a question that we are ceremonially unclean, that we're only messed up a bit on the outside, that we've got a little bit of a dirt of sin on us that we need to take care of simply being washed or something like that. No, we need a total transformation. What image did Jesus give us about salvation? Remember that time when Nicodemus came to meet with the Master at night? And he started talking very pleasantly with Jesus. And Jesus just hits him with this statement. You must be born again. That's what he said. And because we've heard that so often over the years, we just take that as being a, a general description of, of Christians. But Nicodemus gives the right kind of answer. What are you talking about? How can I go back into my mother's womb? That's just not a possibility. But Jesus is saying this because he wants Nicodemus to understand that it's not just a question of living well, following all those rules and regulations, being a good member of the Sanhedrin as he was. No, it is being completely reborn. A total change. And only God can do that. Only God can come in and remake us. And only He can heal us because salvation, true salvation, is about being healed. We are in the process, as we come to God, of being healed, of having our minds transformed, thinking good thoughts, by beholding what? We become changed. As we look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. It's all there, isn't it? You put all these texts together, you begin to understand. It's not a question of just worrying about being not guilty. It's about being reworked 
reborn into a whole different kind of person. Paul also uses the whole idea of being a new creation, that we are new beings, that we are not, therefore, as these new beings, subject to the kind of life that we lived before. We find it hard to live that way. Paul did too. As we've said before, he said, all the things I want to do, I don't do those, and all the things I don't want to do, those are the ones I end up doing. There's that battle that's going on. And he says that he wanted to be delivered from this body of death. He has this idea. He's walking around with a body of death strapped to him. His former way of life. His former self. And he wants to be healed from that. And he says, who can deliver me from that? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, he said. He's the one who can do this. He's the one who can remake us. He's the divine sin physician who can take care of all this evil that we want to do and rework our minds to help us to overcome, to live the way that we know we should do. Yeah, in our own strength, we can't do it. We, we rely on the one who gives us not just a, a prescription for medicine, but the one who lives in us, empowers us, Christ in you, the hope of glory, the one who truly can save and heal you from the inside out. Well, I hope that stimulated your minds to think a little bit and that you have some questions. How do you put that all together with the statements about uh, living right and uh, issues of the legal nature? Uh, if we are being saved, what are we being saved from? What are we being saved to? Uh, how does God truly remake us in His image? How does this healing process really occur? Many questions that you may have. So I'm going to invite Glenn to come back up and we'll take your questions. If you'd like to come down to the front and ask questions or even hand in slips of paper with uh, any questions you might have, we'll be happy to take those at this time. As the usual process has been, we invite anyone with questions to come forward and sit up front so that we can invite you onto the stage and you can ask your question personally. Also, if there are people who prefer to submit their questions in a written format that I can read out, please just indicate and I will um, come and collect that from you. So we would really invite anyone who has a question to come forward now. And maybe I'll use my prerogative as having the mic in my hand to kick it off, Dr. Gallagher, and ask you, I really like the idea of salvation as healing, but I wanted to ask you, when does the full, can full healing take place prior to God recreating the earth and our, and our bodies, or are there further things that have to happen before we can experience full healing? And of course, we are looking from our perspective at it, at the woman who came along. She came and wanted therapy. She got the cure, the eye on my. But then Jesus says, you have the salvation healing because the physical healing was combined with the spiritual healing. You are totally healed. Question, what happened to that lady? Did she live forever from then on? No, she died. So this whole process, and everybody, it's a sad comment really to think about, everybody that Jesus healed died. Even the ones that he rose from the dead, that he resurrected, they also died. It was a temporary kind of healing because that's this sinful world. But we begin now, and we recognize that salvation is a process. If somebody says to you, well, let me ask you that tonight, are you saved? How do you answer? Some of our evangelical friends like to ask that question. Are you saved? Yes, no, maybe, possibly. You know, we want to talk about the assurance of salvation on the one hand, 
but then we don't want to be arrogant and presumptuous on the other, do we? So we try and take a middle road. Maybe the whole question is a little flawed, though. Are you saved? Where is the emphasis now? On you. So when people ask me that question, I like to say, I know the Savior. Because I want to point it away from myself. As Spurgeon said, I looked at Jesus and the dove of peace flew into my heart. I looked into my heart and the dove of peace flew away. Keeping the focus where it needs to be. And as soon as you say, are you saved, it ends up being about me and my performance, doesn't it? Maybe it's a better thing to say, I know the physician who saves and heals. So I would say that salvation is, a, is that process. I am saved now, and there is some things which are in potential, and I am being saved. Maybe that's another better way to say it. I am being saved. There is a process going on there. And I will be saved, ultimately and finally and completely, when Jesus returns. 1 Corinthians 15, what does it say? In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, what? We shall be changed, and this mortal shall put on immortality. Death is gone. It's done with. We are changed. We are remade, finally and completely at that point. But there is a process that goes on. And you can talk about justification and sanctification and other big, long words. I would rather use words like set right and kept right or the beginning of healing or the continuing of healing uh, as a way of describing what salvation's all about. Maybe that helps that, that question. That does. Thank you very much. Right. We have a very interesting subject tonight, and I'm sure some of you have questions. Is there anyone who would like to ask a question but has written it down that would like me to come and collect it? Is there anyone who would like to come up to the front and ask a question? I think everybody believes it. <laughs> You've done a very convincing job tonight. Shock. Hi, evening. Um, salvation as healing. Um, I see Jesus in his life. He demonstrated that, like you said, mm -hmm. he's the healer. He just went about healing people. I don't see him going condemning people, telling them you're not guilty, you're not guilty, you're not guilty. I just see him healing so he demonstrated to us. Doesn't this whole idea then completely destroy the idea that we are in any legal trouble? And um, if that's the case, where, if a person maybe believes he is in legal trouble with God, where is the misunderstanding in that whole idea? Okay, thank you very much. That's a good question. Uh, yes, Jesus didn't go around trying to tell people I'm giving you pardons and not guilty verdicts and all the rest of that. He went around saying that the Father loved them and that he cared for them and that he was healing them. And he demonstrated that by, very much by the, by the healing process. Maybe we need to step back again and ask what went wrong in the first place and, uh, and, and how that was viewed. If you think you are in legal trouble with God, I suppose the text that, you know, to him that, believe it, it is a sin, it is a sin. And God will deal with people at that level, at that, uh, at that stage in their, their experience. Um, but it's, it tends to be people who are dealing with God on a more, I call it, contractual basis. Um, Jesus said that he called us his friends, and we're going to look at that tomorrow. He, we are not his servants. He says, I don't call you servants anymore, because a servant doesn't understand his Father's business. I call you friends because everything I know from the Father I've, I've shared with you. You understand. And that's that kind of understanding of God is what Jesus was really emphasizing when he was dealing with those kinds of, of people. Uh, I think we need also, however, to, to mention that he did particularly speak very strongly to a particular group of people. Do you remember? when he talked with the, those who thought that they had achieved salvation. 
by what they had done, by the legal process, by making sure they had not broken any of their rules and regulations. He called them, what? Hypocrites, whitened sepulchres full of dead men's bones. That's a little tough, isn't it? And other things like that. So, and I don't think he did it with any kind of malice. I cannot believe that our Lord ever spoke with any kind of malice. But he did want to get their attention. And so he spoke very strongly and very directly. And they got very upset with him. Because he was being very pointed in his comments. And that pointed commentary really dealt with people who were operating from a legal perspective. We have done and we've kept all the requirements. In fact, we've added requirements to make sure we've protected all the law. And what does he say? You've made the law of God of none effect by teaching instead of the commandments of God, the commandments of men. So he really did try and help them understand it. Now, when we come to talk about the breaking of the law, let us be very clear, I am not an antinomian. What's that? Somebody who is against the law. Anti, which is against, nomos, the law. I am not an antinomian. I'm not saying that the law is something we should reject or do away with. In fact, I'm with Paul when he says the law is very good. But the law is the schoolmaster, the paedagogus that draws us to Christ, that brings us to Christ. Not that we, we, see, we read that sometimes as schoolmaster, and we think it's a bit like the old-fashioned schoolmaster with a cane. No, this is the, the slave of the household who takes the child to school and uh, is part of that process of, of what you might call gentle instruction. The law, points out, the law points out where we go wrong, what we are doing. And so it is something of great benefit. But as a means of salvation, as the Pharisees tried, it just doesn't work. And it leads you into a very false state of security. You think you're fine when you're not. And Jesus tried to break through that because they were very proud that they had achieved it. But if you read back there, I think it's in Proverbs, isn't it? Where God says, pride and arrogance do I hate. Why does God hate pride and arrogance? Because he can't get through to those kinds of people because they think they're fine when they're not. So I think that is part of the answer to your question in terms of dealing with the, those who are operating from a law-based mechanism of salvation. It's not that the law is bad, it's just that it just points out where everything's wrong and how much you need help and how much you need the healing that only God can provide. Thank you for your question. And I'll try and keep them quite shorter, but you do ask such interesting questions. Uh, Dr. Gallagher, I think it was a man called Christopher Hitchkins who wrote a book called God is Not Great. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's a bestseller, more than a million copies sold and so on. So uh, I, he posed the question, and I thought, you know, my sinfulness, this is so easy to answer because even a baby in the faith, could, but I would like to know your answer on it. And he says, and it's kind of a leading question, why all this needless prayer in Jesus' life when with one word he could have healed the whole world of all their sicknesses and uh, prevented so much suffering and death? Mm. Yeah, very good question. Uh, maybe we could add a few thoughts to that too. Why is it? that Jesus, as far as we know, as recorded in the Gospels, only ever raised three people from the dead during his actual ministry. I'm not talking about later on and what happened at the cross and things like that. But during his ministry, just three. Why? Why didn't he just speak the word and everybody in the whole planet would have been healed? Well, if Jesus wasn't there people have, wouldn't have worked out why that had happened. And most of all, Jesus was trying not to take the credit, certainly not, but they, he wanted them to understand where this was coming from. He was talking about demonstration. He's demonstrating 
the healing power of God and the change that can come as you trust in him. So as he illustrates that by doing things, he even makes a bit of, he spits on the ground, makes a little bit of mud and puts it on the, on the eyes. Why that? Was that absolutely necessary? No, he could have spoken and it would have happened as he, happened, as he did in other cases. So that is simply to show to us what's going on, who's doing it. It wasn't an accident. It wasn't some kind of random cure. It wasn't spontaneous remission of some disease. It was because Jesus actually did that. And as he went around healing, as I say, not because he wanted to get a word for himself or or fame for himself. He, He wanted people to understand that this healing person in himself was God, God the healer. So I think in many ways, recognizing that the healing that he provided was always going to be temporary, recognizing that what he really wanted to perform, could I say, were heart transplants, where he turned those hearts of stone into hearts of flesh, as we read there in the Old Testament, and transform them. He could have done as you had said. Could have done that. God could have done that from heaven. Jesus did not have to come here. The Father could have done that. But he wouldn't have showed what had happened. He wouldn't have meant anything in, the, in that sense. People would not have connected it. And think about this philosophically. If God had always been stepping in to heal us from every problem, if every time we were going the wrong way, he would pull us back. If no accidents ever happened. In fact, we lived in a world of sin and nothing ever went wrong. Would that not be a very strange thing for the God of heaven to be maintaining? So, it's part of the answer in the cosmic conflict that sin not only kills but it creates a world of suffering, that the innocent suffer along with the guilty, and it just really... Don't you want it all to finish? I almost want to plead with the Lord, say, please, Lord, well, at least I speak for myself. I've had enough. I, I read on the news. I see all these things. I hear stories about what happens to little babies and and all the terrible things of this world, What, please, can't you finish it, Lord? And the word I get back from the Lord in heaven is, if you think it's bad, how do you think I feel? Really. Every moment this sinful, evil, suffering world continues is an affront and a terrible pain to a loving God. But he lets it continue for this higher reason that's part of the cosmic conflict. So, I think in the quick answer to your question is that because there had to be direct demonstration and that it's not out of harmony with a loving God to act in the way that he did. Thank you very much. Um, I, I just have a quick question. On, on you were talking about um, Jesus healing the blind man. Mm-hmm. There's also um, uh, an account of him healing another blind man um, and I forget where it is now exactly, but he, he, he touched his eyes and then he asked him, what do you see? And he, sees, he says, I see people walking, but they look like trees. trees yeah. and, and then he touched them again. Um, y- you know, that to me is just interesting. You've got any thoughts on that? Why didn't he just heal it the first time? You know, it, um, just a question about that. Right, right. And uh, we don't know too much about the, the circumstances. I wonder how he knew what trees looked like, but maybe he had seen trees before, before he went blind. I mean, there's a, I mean, or was he, I don't think he was born blind, was he? Doesn't, I don't remember the story either. But the, I think the, and, and you could see that, I suppose, as a half miracle to start with and then the full miracle. Testing his faith. Well, I don't know that he was testing his faith. It's just kind of showing perhaps, as we were just saying, that salvation is a process. And healing is a process. And that maybe, in some cases, people are instantly healed. Some people are healed in a process. 
Some of us, we know that we get limited healing, you know, talking physically. And sometimes we don't get any healing at all. Well, why is that? Because we're part of this cosmic conflict, and truly I believe that God does know best, but we still have many questions. So. I just have something. It's not a question, but I'd like to share with, with everybody. Going back to Luke 7, verse 50, um, reading from the Amplified. But Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Uh, enter into peace, and then peace is defined here in freedom from all the distresses that are experienced as the result of sin, that peace. And, and people have defined peace not as the absence of war, but as the presence of God. Right. And the, also coming back to the question just now that you asked, what do you answer when somebody asked you, um, are you saved? Um, and I heard this from somebody, he says, um, if they ask him that, then I say, so far... Um, I accepted Jesus this morning, and if I continue to accept him day by day and moment by moment, then one day when he comes, then I will be saved then too. Very good. Yes, it's an ongoing experience. What did Paul say? Talking about his daily experience. I die daily. Well, that could seem a little morbid, couldn't it? What's he really talking about? Putting to death the sinful self. Choosing, not himself, but living for God, with God within him. All these are images. You understand that. We're using image-based concepts, words that are also capable of multiple understandings. We're trying to reach for an idea that almost escapes our language. So let us not be surprised that many of the images and the parallels that we develop don't quite match. Um, I'm still in process. You're still in process. We're, we're trying to see how this works out in our own personal lives. And we want to choose what is good, but we find that that's not always what we end up doing. And, we, and salvation isn't a linear growth process of going up and up and up. It's kind of it has its ups and downs, doesn't it? Hopefully by the end of life, we've had more ups than downs. And particularly with God within us, then he is leading us on and sees what we are in potential. Yes. Good evening, Dr. Gallagher. Hello. Um, I've just got a question in terms of, and I've been thinking of how to phrase it in that, but the whole concept of we're all different people here. And everybody's got a different character, different, you know, tendencies to different behaviors and certain patterns. You've got the sort of person who's ultra fit and used to doing certain things and who, who can get into a pattern and stay in a pattern. You know, and then you've got the person who tends to be here and there and there and there. And the challenge of being so different and so vast, one person, the one who's used to the achieving the mark, reaching the next goal, you know, salvation sort of fits in like that. Mm -hmm. And then you've got the other person who picks it up there, puts it down, finds something else, loses his keys along the way, you know. And it's just challenging sometimes to experience a consistent level of um, salvation in this world mm -hmm. of, of inconsistency. The thing is, what I'm really trying to ask is that you know, is it really fair to try and measure my salvation in, in terms of I've done this, I've done that, and, you know, I've managed for a month to stay on this salvation diet. You know, it just feels sometimes it just gets so tiring. So, yeah, it's more a sort of open-ended question, and it's sort of just something that sits at the back of my mind sometimes. How do you deal with all the different people and their different views of salvation? Thank you for that. I, I particularly like your idea of the salvation diet because that really kind of sums it up. All these people have all these different diets and there's more diets, particularly where I live in the US, than, than anything else. Everybody's on a diet. You know, it's a, this diet and that diet and, you know, one is high fat, and one is high cholesterol, and it's all crazy, you know. <laughs> well, maybe even the opposite. And uh, people are, 
are trying this and trying that, trying this because they have, there's a terrible preoccupation in our modern world with how we look. We want to look good. And we want to feel good. And there's a word, isn't there? Feeling. Is salvation dependent on how you feel today? You know, this evening, I feel saved. Does that not strike you as a bit of a strange statement? I hope so. I feel saved. Um, and then tomorrow, you know, I overslept. I didn't get to church on time. Sister so-and-so said something nasty to me in the foyer. The pastor preached at me. I don't feel saved today. Is salvation a question of how we feel? Or is it a question of what we know from this book? When you read certain statements that God makes to us, do you truly accept them? If you ask in faith, nothing wavering, you will receive. You know, these, these strong promises that God says, I will be with you, even unto the end of the world. I'm not giving up on you. Those wonderful statements that John makes in his epistles, particularly, about the assurance of God and his love for you. So, thank you for your question. I, is salvation about true grit of fighting our way through? Um, do we somewhat misunderstand that verse that says, work out your own salvation with what? Fear and trembling. Do we have to work out our own salvation? Is it a do-it-yourself religion? Is that what it's saying? No, it's not saying that at all. It is saying you need to pay attention to it. And I do relate to that whole idea of you know, sometimes things seem to be going well and sometimes they don't seem to be going so well. I have a feeling we're closer to God when things aren't going so well than when we're by the still waters and in the green pastures. It's on the rocky slopes and on the rocky path that, that we truly come to find God as he really is. He's, he walks beside us on the way and carries us on the way. All these are imagery, all this is imagery again that we're trying to use to describe that relationship we have with God. That's what we're really wanting, isn't it? That healing, loving salvation that Christ gives to us. The one question that, was, that came in was reflecting back on the issue of the definition of sin. That sin is the transgression of the law and that's the only definition that you should take. Well... Uh, you could accept that, and let's play that one out for a little bit, uh, as the transgression of the law. What do we say that the law is? Transcript of God's character. So how do we transgress God's character? The transcript of God's character. What is God's character? Love. Goodness, trustworthiness, and you could add to that. When Eve in the garden said to herself, well, who knows what she exactly said, but she, by listening to the serpent and then acting on what he said, you would say that she believed the serpent, wouldn't you? She accepted what he had said at least enough to try. She trusted him. By trusting the serpent, what has she done to that relationship with God? Distrusted him. Before she even takes the fruit, she's decided that. She's decided the serpent has some degree of truth on his side, I'm willing to risk things by going his way. That's her mental decision, isn't it? Something like that. And the fact that she goes that route, and then afterwards, after the thought comes the action. So, 
here it says that the scissors isn't a broken relationship. It causes a broken relationship. I think the relationship breaks and then there is the action. The thought comes first. That's the way it would seem to me. But we could debate that for the long, long time. The real key, though, is the result is of separation. That sin comes in by that choice of Eve and then Adam to go with the serpent's view and not with God's view. And when God comes on the scene, it's clearly a broken relationship because they're terrified of him. They run away and they hide. There are other definitions of sin in Scripture, and I'm sure that whoever wrote this isn't saying that there are no other ways of describing sin. When you read things like whatsoever is not of faith is sin, that's a biblical text, and you're not going to say that that's not part of Scripture. What does that text mean? Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. What's faith? How would we say, how would we describe faith today? Faith is trusting God, isn't it? So whatever is not of trusting God is sin. Turn it the other way around to get the direct statement. Sin is distrusting God. That's what that verse says. And that's exactly what happened there in the garden. So this distrusting God, which is what causes the problem, what is the broken relationship? When you distrust somebody, you don't have a relationship anymore, do you? If husbands and wives fall out and they don't trust each other anymore, that's when they start going to the lawyers. <laughs> that's when the law comes in. You go and see a divorce lawyer. You start operating on very legal frameworks because there's been a disruption, a breaking of the relationship. It's the breaking of the relationship that then leads to all the legal machinery coming in as part of the process. So that would be my answer to that particular question that came in. Thank you for the question. Jen, if you'd like to come up, thanks. I rather like um, salvation being thought of as healing. And I'm wondering about Christ's death on the cross ensuring our salvation. Take me a little further of where you're thinking. Well, I'm thinking that because healing is a process, and for me, um, seeing Christ on the cross is a very moving experience. Mm -hmm. um, and that starts my healing because I'm moved by what Christ did for me um, and for all of us in terms of starting that healing process. That sounds very much like the moral influence theory. And surely that's heresy, isn't it? Well, it's Sorry, a good heresy for cheek. me. No, and I, I, I'm teasing a little bit there because that's the sort of thing that people throw in my direction mm. all too often when I'm, I'm speaking about that. Um, and this whole idea that that can't be what it's all about. But didn't Jesus say, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all to me? And on the cross, doesn't he draw us by that attractive power of his self-sacrificing love? And, and I have no hesitation to say, yes, I am saved by God's grace mm -hmm. and by his death on the cross. And, and I just love it when my friend who um, has cancer can say, I am safe. I'm safe for now. I'm safe for eternity mm -hmm. because of the history we have with the loving God. Yeah, because we trust in the one who can save. That's where the, the trust needs to be placed. If we sort of place it in ourselves on what we have done, what we have accomplished, like those folk in Jesus' time that he had to speak so strongly to, they thought they had achieved salvation by their observance of the law. And that really doesn't get you to where you need to be because you're placing confidence in, in your own action. And how can we save ourselves? Can we pull ourselves up by our bootstraps, as they say? So, yeah, thank you for that. That's uh, a good way of 
pointing us back to, to God. Let me, let me ask you if, you, if you, if you had an incomplete understanding of what the cross really does, does that prevent you from being saved? No. Not at all. Good. Because for me, I would have to say, based on the evidence that we have in Scripture and elsewhere, that we're going to spend a long time considering Christ's death on the cross. In fact, we're going to study that throughout all eternity. So if we had a, a complete answer now, <laughs> what are we going to be doing for eternity? That would be one thing. The other thing is, how can we understand all of that when it is such a deep, meaningful, multiple question answering experience as we think of it in all the different levels. What does it say about God? What does it say about sin? What does it say about the devil? What does it say about us? What does it say about the cosmic conflict? What does it say about uh, what death really is? What does it say about how we can be healed? All those kinds of things come in there, don't they? And about um, the feelings aspect, mm -hmm. the seminar has tended to to concentrate on the the cognitive, the the mm -hmm. thinking. Keep coming back to what you're thinking, and but there is a very very emotional component to spirituality, and and I don't think that that must ever be negated because when we are feeling depressed or we are feeling lonely or we are feeling sad that that is part of our spiritual journey and and to know how to deal with that um, is, is critically important to that spiritual journey and did you hear what you said there with the, you you talked about the emotions, and then you used a cognitive word in how you dealt with them. You have to know how you to deal with them. Uh, I think that is exactly the way I would want to say it, too. Yes, we do have all kinds of emotions that play upon us. Uh, when I'm reading Scripture, and I discover some truth I had never discovered before. Exciting. It's exciting, it's thrilling, I'm joyful, I'm weeping, you know. Um, if I have come across as a rather mm, stiff upper lip Englishman. Yes, yes. If I have. <laughs> careful how I say this now. You will have to look again at my name. What is my last name? The last name is Gallagher. And really, you know, I have to talk like this because my grandfather, he came over from Southern Ireland. And you know the Irish, what are they famous for, apart from the whiskey? It's a very emotional kind of people. They're very emotional, and they will weep and laugh at a drop of a hat. So I have some of that, and especially the melancholy. The Irish love to be sad. And I have to remind myself not to enjoy it too much. Now you're thinking I am very strange, aren't you? Um, but... Your point about emotions, I thank you for, for raising that. Uh, if we had another session, that's exactly what I will want to talk about. Well, what is the relationship between faith and emotion? You read the Psalms. Don't tell me that religion is not emotion. Full of human emotions, running the gamut from happiness to sadness and from anger to fear and everything else in between. It's all in there. The point is, it's what you know about God that leads you to that wonderful experience, that emotional experience. It's what you know. If you put the emotions first, then one day you're happy, one day you're sad, and your faith is going up and down like that. Whereas we read what God has done and is doing, and the fact that he is trustworthy. So whether I'm happy or whether I'm sad, I still know God is my Savior. Would you say that that would be true? Yes, and that, that is my struggle with, 
and I guess I'm happy to leave it to God to deal with, but I, I, I'm convinced that as Christians, it's our duty to deal with it as well, and, and our, not our duty, but our loving pleasure to deal with those who have been injured mm -hmm. and are in great pain and struggle because of early childhood experience. And ongoing experiences that lead you to sadness and great pain too. So, yeah, thank you very much. So, thank you. I'm, I'm grateful for the safety that um, I experience as a result of the, the really moving part of the king of the universe being willing to come and die as a human being. For you individually. For me and us all. Thank you. I'd just like to help uh, Miguel uh, answer his question, uh, if I may, and maybe the, the, the problem that all of us have in our up and down Christian life um, with how we behave. Um, if Jesus had to come down the aisle here tonight or now and say to me, Alfonso, I want you never to sin again, uh, would I say, sure, Jesus, I'll, I'll do that? I wouldn't be able to. I'd, I'd have to fall on my knees and say, I'm in trouble. But if he came down the aisle here and said, Alfonso, I want you to have a relationship with me day by day, that, that is a doable. And I think that's what he, he wants each one of us to do moment by moment to, to develop and to um, make that a reality in our lives. Thank you for that, especially because when we focus on sin, what becomes the most important thing in our life? You know, if I tell you not to think about anything red, what have you just started thinking about? Everything that's red, isn't it? You know, that's the way our minds work. So if I keep on telling you don't sin, don't sin, don't sin, you're going to be thinking about all the things that you could be doing wrong or should end up doing wrong and all these other things. Whereas, as Alfonso says, if, if you're thinking of that relationship with Jesus, you focus in on the positive. That's not to say that sin is not significant or an important thing to deal with. But you don't deal with evil by concentrating on it. You emphasize the good, and you squeeze out the evil as a consequence. So, looking unto Jesus... By beholding, we become changed. What are we looking at? That's a significant point. A question we've received is, <clears throat> excuse me, can salvation be lost? And if so, how? Can you lose salvation? Do you have choice throughout your life? Yes, you do. When Paul says things like, I die daily, what is he really talking about? He's saying, I make a daily choice. Where am I going? What am I choosing? In the end, can you not have the choice to go back? You know, there are some who believe once saved, always saved. It may sound a comforting doctrine, but I think it negates God's great emphasis on freedom. We make multiple choices every day, all kinds of things that we do. Where we, what we do, what we spend time on, what we concentrate on, whether we read our Bibles or not, whether we pray or not, whether we seek God or not, whether we go to church or not, whether we... You know, you know what I'm saying. We all make our daily choices. And losing salvation, I suppose it's a bit like Romans 1 when we just don't go to God anymore. And we don't respond anymore. And when He appeals, we ignore it. Until we come to a point where we don't even want to choose God at all. 
And God says, okay. I don't think it's in an angry or threatening voice, but as he describes in Romans 1, 24, 26, and 28, he abandoned those people. The worst thing in the universe is to be abandoned by God. When he says, like a physician, there's nothing more I can do for you because you never have listened to what I've said. I mean, if you go to the doctor and uh, he prescribes some kind of therapy, some course of medication or whatever, uh, you go back next week and say, Doctor, I'm still sick. Did you take the medication? Oh, no. I haven't filled the prescription yet. Well, that might be a reason why you're still feeling sick. Go and fill the prescription. Next week you go back, oh, I'm still feeling sick. Did you fill the, the prescription? Yes. Did you take it? No. I mean, it sounds so foolish, doesn't it? And yet, that's kind of the way we deal with God. We don't follow His way. We don't love what He says is good, and we don't follow what is right. And then we're surprised when life is so bad and that we're still sick. Part of the process is to put yourself into God's hands as you put yourself into your physician's hands trusting what he or she says. If we don't trust what our heavenly physician says as the way that we should live, don't be surprised that we're going to go on being sick and eventually that we won't have the salvation that it leads to eternal life. Thank you very much for your questions. I think we have one more. Okay. We'll take this as the last question. You know, at the end of the week, everybody starts working out how this operates and we could go for hours. I'd love it. Thank you, Dr. Gallagher, for <clears throat> pointing out the therapeuta and the other word as the lady was eventually totally healed. Now, can we take this a bit further? In uh, 1 Corinthians 15, eventually, will the healing process take place in the twinkling of an eye? Or are there greater dimensions to healing throughout eternity? Is it a process then still? That's an interesting point. When we enter into the eternity that God has provided, we are completely changed. We are totally healed in the sense of where we are. It's a bit like Adam and Eve, I think. They were perfect in so far as they had been created, but they had not had very much experience, you could say. What, do we, what happens throughout eternity? Do we not grow? Does that mean to say that we weren't perfectly healed in the beginning? I don't think you could say that, no. But we do grow and we develop and I look forward to that. I think that's where you're pointing us, that eternity is certainly not going to be boring because we are going to grow and develop and learn and enjoy. We are told that we become like God, small g. What does that mean? We are partakers of the divine nature. You tell me what that means. How do we partake of the divine nature? I find this extremely exciting, this idea that we're going to sit up on cloud strumming harps. I'm sorry. That does not do it for me. I want this ever-expanding, creative experience that God has in store. What does it say? I has not heard. I has not seen. An ear has not heard. And it hasn't entered into the mind of men the thing that God's have prepared for them that love him. And that is an incredible thought. So I don't want to miss out because I don't want to miss that. You know, I'm not so worried about the streets of gold and the gates of pearl and everything, but that wonderful experience of all that creativity, all that learning and all that ability, you know. I tell people that, because uh, I can't sing, and I look forward to being able to sing, I don't even sing in the shower. Uh, I tell people over there in England that I have an Albert Hall voice, which impresses them greatly. 
You know the Albert Hall, this big concert hall there in London. I have an Albert Hall voice. And he said, really? Yes, I said, it sounds good with 10,000 others. So I look forward to that. Everything that we don't have now, that we could have in potential, is going to be there. And more than just a, a singing voice and doing away with my, my glasses and all the other things that, uh, that we see in this world. Have you noticed? See, you've already got me off on another big tangent. But just, just to conclude, as we read in Revelation, the end, right there in the final chapters, this earth made new is really defined in what is not there. There will be no more pain, no more suffering, no more tears. God will wipe away the tears from our eyes. There will be no more death. And sorrow and sighing will flee away. You know, all these, all these statements are about things that aren't going to be there because our world is so crammed full of all these negative aspects. It's the removal of all of that. But then think of what it will be like from the positive point of view. And I haven't even mentioned the best part, which is to be there with our loving Lord for all eternity. Thank you very much for a wonderful evening together. I have uh, always thought that we could go on longer, but then I remember that I'm not to wear out the patience of the saints. So let us close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, how good it has been to meet together with your people, to share together. To sense that spirit of oneness, that atonement that is already here, beginning here. We've talked a lot about salvation and what it means, and we've used lots of images. Most of all, we've spoken that salvation at heart is about healing. We want to be healed. We want of our hearts of stone turned into hearts of flesh that truly feel, that truly beat, that truly are alive because they've been healed by your wonderful touch. Again, we come to you, Lord, like the woman who just wanted to touch the edge of your garment so that we can be healed from all these things that keep us tied down, cause us problems, cause us pain. These temptations that lead to sin that are so often in our heads. Lord, yes, maybe we should pray. Please come in, redirect our thoughts, rewire our brains. Not that you would ever take away our freedom to think, but help us to think more clearly. Help us to experience in our lives the healing that can come only from you, the divine physician. Often we think very specifically about physical healing, and truly we would wish that. But most of all, Lord, the greatest gift you can give us right now is the spiritual healing that will turn our hearts back to you, wanting to follow you, loving your ways, and looking forward to your coming when you come to take us home. In Jesus' name, amen.